Okay. All right, so I'm going to start. All right, so this is chapter two, part two. And, oh, goodness, this. I'm, I'm recording this because I've got a, um, I've got a Monday, Tuesday night lab. And you can, as you might imagine, I'm a little behind in that class. <coughs> Based partly on the fact that I'm a long-winded blowhard talks and talks and talks about things and never gets anywhere. And partly because, um, as you may have noticed, I had, didn't really have an opportunity to do that last week because it was kind of snowy. So um, this is chapter two, part two. Everyone should have this handout out. This is what I'm going to be talking about. Chapter two, part one, I will not be lecturing about in the interest of time. Um, it is stuff that I already expect you guys to know. All right? So chapter two, part one says chemistry for micro 205. Is that what it says? Chemistry for, for biology. Yeah, let me see that one. So that's chapter two, part one. Yeah, that's right. Um, structure of the atom. Um, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Covalent bonds, ionic bonds, hydrogen bonds, acids and bases the pH scale, um, and chemical properties of water. Those are things that I'm going to expect you guys to already know. Is that clear? Um, I will not be testing on them directly. Okay? So I will not give you a big chunk of quiz or test questions based on that material directly. However, that material is foundational. Right? Understanding how hydrogen bonds work and how covalent bonds work is essential to understanding the shapes of proteins, which I will be testing you on. Is that clear? You guys get the idea that it's, it's not something that I'm intending to test you directly, but it is something that you're responsible for knowing. And you may suffer if you don't know, right? But you guys have, hopefully, you've had some kind of chemistry. I know I teach that it intro human biology here. Right? If you took human biology, I know that, that physiology or bio 1A, 195, are prerequisites for this class. Yeah. Um, so if you've had those, then you've had some chemistry already, and you're responsible for knowing it. Is that clear? All right. <clears throat> so this is chapter 2, part 2. And I'm recording, furthermore, I'm recording this in, uh, in, uh, in parts. So I'll be stopping periodically to make these, these little chunks of lecture a little more digestible to my poor Monday, Tuesday students. OK? All right? So here's a question. Which type of bond exists between adjacent molecules of water? Pretty easy question. Hopefully, yeah, if you're saying hydrogen bond, you're right. Um, the properties of a hydrogen bond, what a hydrogen bond is, is something, again, that I want you guys to know. Is that clear? Um, all right. So I just put all these little things that say part one, part two, part three, part four. And I'll try to stop at some point in those so that, um, so that uh, my poor Monday, Tuesday night students can, can have that. All right. So in covalent bonding, um, as we already know, and as I expect you guys to know, pairs of valence electrons are shared and molecules are formed. Covalent bonds help you form molecules. Um, carbon, furthermore, matters because it has four valence electrons and it wants, do you know how many in its outer shell? Eight, the octet rule, yeah, so it wants eight electrons and as a result, it generally forms covalent bonds with four other things. So um, four covalent bonds, and that makes uh, carbon a really, really versatile building block, OK? What we'll see in all of this is, I don't know if you remember layers of organization, cells into tissues, tissues into organs, organs into organ systems, and so on. But what you'll see is a sort of modularity towards 
structure at various levels. And the first level <coughs> in organic chemistry is the carbon atom. So um, organic chemistry itself is the chemistry of carbon. Carbon is so special that uh, there's an entire branch of chemistry all about it, and that's organic chemistry. Um, <coughs> so in light of that, it's worth pointing out that organic uh, does not necessarily mean that organic chemicals uh, are things that you get at Whole Foods. Is that clear? Yeah? Okay. So organic in the context of grocery stores, that means grown without pesticides and so on. Organic in the, in the field of chemistry means made out of carbon atoms. Yeah? Okay. It doesn't even, organic chemistry is also not the definition of the chemistry of living things. Um, many organic molecules come from living things. Um, gasoline, though, this, this molecule at the top is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbon atoms long. So this is, um, anyone know? This is octane, right? And octane is stuff in gas, and the percentage of your gas that's octane tells you your octane rating for your gasoline and whether you're high octane or low octane or whatever, yeah? Um, again, we don't get gasoline uh, in a jar at Whole Foods on the shelf, yeah? So, um, and, it's, and gasoline may have come from and actually did come from um, molecules of living things, but it is not a molecule you would find in any living things now. Does that make sense? It has been geologically finagled. Okay, so hydrocarbons are a basic example. And both octane that you see here and this ring thing that you see here are hydrocarbons. That means they are things that are comprised solely of carbon and hydrogen. Okay, so here is octane again. And what we can see here is that this picture of octane and this picture of octane are both showing octane. Yeah, they're showing the same thing. They're showing it in different ways. And as we go through this chapter especially, and really as we go through the whole class, we're going to see the same thing shown in different kinds of ways, okay? So how is the way I show octane in this picture different from how I show it here? Can you guys see? You can see all of it here. In other words, what we see are the, these are the electron shells of the atoms that the octane is comprised of. So we see the shape. Here we see the, the letters that we would find on the periodic table of the atoms that are, it's comprised of. Okay? Does that make sense? Um, so there's no letter C's on all these. You're expected to sort of know that these are carbon atoms and these are hydrogen atoms around it. Does that make sense? What about these red dots here? Those are not either hydrogen or carbon, those are oxygen atoms. In any case, can you see the similarity between the octane and the triglyceride? Or the, um, yeah, it's a triglyceride, yeah? So this is a fat molecule. This is the oil in which these french fries are fried, right? Um, they are both good energy sources, yeah? If you eat this, you can burn this for calories. Please do not eat gasoline. Right, despite the molecular similarity. Okay? That's another take home message here is that molecules can be similar, but they're not always the same, and, and sometimes small differences really matter. Okay? So, either way, this is a good source of calories, energy for you. This is a source of calories, energy for the car. Okay? Maybe we don't think of um, gasoline in terms of calories, but calories are a unit of heat when you burn something. Gasoline burns very well, and it, and it, and it uh, is a good source of energy. That's why we use it in gas. <coughs> okay. Energy is required to form covalent bonds. Energy is released when they're broken. Carbon compounds are usually combustible. That is, they burn in the presence of oxygen. Both of those burn. All right. So carbon pretty much always forms four bonds, except in very transitional states. And again, we have three different ways to look at the same molecule. Um, and this, is, this doesn't tell us the whole story about the kinds of pictures we'll see. But we'll see many kinds of pictures of the same thing. 
This molecule is methane. Yeah? Have you guys heard of methane? So methane is, a, is CH4, the sim, one of the simplest organic molecules around. Probably the simplest. Carbon always forms four bonds. And if you see all these different molecules, you can see that they are all different hydrocarbons. Um, and carbon is in them. And it always has four bonds in every picture. Yeah? And we name these methane, ethane, propane. Have you heard of this one? Propane and, and propane accessories. Yeah? Have you heard of butane? Where do you find that? Yeah, you find that in like a click lighter. Um, <clears throat> is butane a liquid, solid, or a gas? Yeah. Kind of a trick question. Um, so if you have one of those little click lighters, you can see the liquid sloshing around on the inside of the lighter, yeah? But if you press the button, does liquid squirt out? It's a gas that comes out when you press the button, right? So um, the, the lighter is pressurized, and when you add extra pressure, it's the, the butane is sort of right at the edge of being in between a liquid and a gas. It's a very, very volatile gas that can be liquefied under pressure. Does that make sense? Um, <coughs> So, so likewise, propane, you can hear that if you use a propane uh, grill to f cook your burgers for your Super Bowl party. Anyone cooking outside today? I, I, in, the, in years past, I, I, I don't know why I've strayed away from my gas grill, but I do have a gas grill, and I would be grilling while it was snowing outside, and I would sweep the snow off the... That's probably information you don't need. In any case, so, um, so we have, um, but it is kind of somehow fun and gratifying to cook a burger in the snow. So if you haven't done that um, and you're a vegetarian, well, that will bless you. Um, if you're not a vegetarian, then, um, and even if you are, you can cook a, cooking a veggie burger would probably feel just as good in the snow um, as cooking a regular burger. All right, so these two molecules, how about them? Are they the same? Something you can see about them is they're similar, right? This is butane. This is isobutane, right? They are not the same. They both have four carbon atoms. They both have the same chemical formula, C4H10, four carbon atoms, 10 hydrogen atoms if you count all the hydrogens. They are not exactly the same because they are arranged differently. And we'll see. So these are called isomers, and we'll see that as we go. All right, you guys with me? Questions? All right, on we go. So we can even form what, what are called double bonds. So we'll see double bonds definitely in the class. So here is um, uh, butene, not butane. This is one butene, and this is two butene. Are they the same? They are similar, but they're not the same, right? This is C4H8. They're both C4H8, so what do we say? Isomers, same chemical formula, different shape, yeah? Is that clear? You guys understand the definition of an isomer, yeah? Okay. <clears throat> Does carbon have four bonds? Yeah, one, two, three, four bonds around all of these carbons, whether there's double bonds between two carbons or not, yeah? Okay. Um, you can even have triple bonds, but we don't see... This is acetylene, that you can make an acetylene torch. A cutting torch, I think, is. Um, in any case, um, it, we don't see triple bonds too often in biology. There's a triple bond between the two atoms in a nitrogen molecule, atmospheric nitrogen. The, atmos the molecule that's most prevalent in our atmosphere that we breathe um, is a triple bonded two nitrogen atoms. But, but uh, that's the only one I can think of. Okay. Carbon it also forms rings, right? So these two, again, carbon is forming four bonds. There's no laws being broken that say that we can't have rings. We can, and so these molecules can definitely exist in organic chemistry, and they can exist in the environment, and do. Um, so the variety of carbon compounds is limitless. So here I have pictures of carbon compounds each of these, right, blue, what are these blue dots here in the center? 
Those are carbon atoms and the little white dots? Hydrogen atoms. What about the gray dots here? Carbon atoms and the white dots? Hydrogen atoms. What about these numbers here? Those are also carbon atoms and here they've been numbered. A lot of times we're going to see pictures of, of what's called a carbon skeleton where they don't even bother to show the letters showing you that those are carbon atoms. They're just sort of going to expect you to know. Um, in any case, as long as carbon forms four bonds, right, you can pretty much link it covalently to uh, nearly anything and you can make nearly anything. The variety of carbon compounds is limitless, okay? <coughs> However, carbon skeletons can be modified and we can modify them with things called functional groups. Functional groups are familiar groups of atoms which affect the properties of the molecule and don't always have carbon in them. So here are some that I want you to know. Hydroxide, which is an OH. It's also called an alcohol group. An amino group, NH2. This is an amine group. Um, carboxyl group, phosphate, methyl, carbonyl, sulfhydryl. Um, <clears throat> all right. So how do these matter? Well, so here is, <clears throat> um, do you see this molecule in the top left? It has a hydroxyl group. <clears throat> Do you see this molecule in the bottom right? It has a carboxyl group. Are they similar? Are they isomers? Top left and bottom right under hyd hydroxyl group with the little one in blue here and carboxyl group with the one in pinkish purple. Are they, this, are they isomers? Yes or no? Raise your hand for yes. Raise your hand for no. No is the correct answer. They're similar, but they're not the same. This one has a double bonded oxygen. This one has two extra hydrogens instead. Yeah? Right? So for the two hydrogens here, we have an oxygen here. Yeah? But carbon has the same number of bonds. They're similar molecules, but they're not isomers. Okay? All right. <clears throat> Do you know what they are? As it turns out, um, well, what about this? They're similar to this one, aren't they? Ethane, right? Here is ethane, C2H6. The only difference between that one and this one, C2H6O, yeah, you might say, or C6, or C2H5OH, I guess. Ethane, and this is ethanol. This is the, an alcohol group. This is booze. This is the active ingredient in wine, beer, vodka, etc the stuff that makes you uh, drunk and feel happy at Super Bowl parties and, and crash your cars and so on, yeah? Is that clear? What happens when your wine, for example, is left out in the open air for a long time and gets oxidized? It turns into vinegar, yeah? This is acetic acid, the active ingredient in vinegar. Does this make you drunk? It does not make you drunk. If you, if you have salad dressing, you are not more likely to crash your car when you drive home compared to when you have a glass of wine, yeah? So this molecule and this molecule are pretty similar. They've been changed in a little way, and one of them makes you drunk, and the other is a nice thing to add to your salad, yeah? Right? Those are pretty big changes in net results for some pretty small changes in functional groups. You understand? So the take home message here is that functional groups matter. They change the shape of molecules and they change the biological behavior of molecules. And the ways they change the behavior of biological molecules is pretty hard to predict. Okay? Right? We couldn't have known that this was going to make us drunk and crashed our cars, and this was going to taste good on a salad, but not make us drunk or make us crash our cars just by looking at the molecule. Does that make sense? All right. So um, 
here's again, this is from your textbook, um, and this is a list of various functional groups. The letter R that you can see here is not on the periodic table at all. Um, so the letter R in this case is a, uh, is a placeholder, right? It's, it's there to show whatever molecule with OH group on it, whatever molecule with aldehyde group on it, whatever molecule with ketone, whatever two sides of the molecule in the midst of which you have a ketone group, etc. Okay, is that good? All right, so here's, here's my, my big whammy picture from another textbook. This is an introductory textbook, but it's a pretty useful picture. Functional groups can radically change the function and behavior of a molecule, right? Are these molecules isomers? They are not isomers. Can you see how they're different? This one has a, the top one has a alcohol or hydroxyl functional group. This one has a ketone functional group, yeah? Um, this one has an extra methyl functional group. This one has a double bond here. This one has three double bonds, where this guy only has one. Yeah? What about all these lines and vertexes in both of them? Those are carbon atoms. A each vertex is a carbon atom, and each line connecting the vertexes, what are those? Those are covalent bonds holding one carbon atom to another. Where are the hydrogen atoms? They're not even shown at all, okay? Why do this? Well, this is a convention. I think it's because organic chemists are lazy and because it allows you to look at the shape of the molecule and get the basics from it, yeah? You get the basic, what's called a carbon skeleton. The shape of the molecule is clear. You can see the similarities and suss out the subtle differences very quickly with this particular design of a molecule, yeah? Does that make sense? or this particular way the molecule is drawn. All right, so the molecules are similar, but they're not the same, right? How, what about the biological effects? Right, this is estradiol. That's the name of this molecule. Have you heard of it? Probably, maybe, you've heard of estrogen. Have you heard of this one, testosterone? Definitely heard of that one, yeah? So the, the difference between these molecules Biologically speaking, right, the differences in functional groups are fairly small. The differences biologically, the consequences of those changes are huge, right? More of the one on the bottom and what? Well, you're going to have more fur, as we can see in the lion. You're going to get in fights more, as the male lion does with other male lions. Maybe you're going to hit more home runs. Oh, oh, sorry, yep, that was a little... I'm from San Francisco, so I, I feel obliged to, to make a wisecrack about some of my former baseball team players. But I guess you guys in Boston have had the same problem, right? Is that Manny, Manny Ramirez, is that right? Anyway, so... Um, yeah, the ba so right across the bay, you had a few other guys hitting... Um, Buku home runs. In fact, I think there were several players on the Giants. Matt Williams, who's now the manager of the uh, um, the Diamondbacks or something. Uh, he was juicing. And what great examples they make. Anyway, so um, in any case, you get the idea, yeah? Um, that's a bit of a digression, forgive me. Um, you get the idea. Small changes in functional groups radically change the function of a mo molecule in a biological system, yeah? A chemist would have a lot harder time saying these molecules were different, but the lion makes it very clear. Okay, so the next, <coughs> so we've learned about functional groups, we've learned about isomers, the next concept is called chirality. Here's another way molecules can be different. You can have what are called chiral stereoisomers. Chiral stereoisomers are molecules that are isomers that are similar 
but different in the way that a mirror image is different from the real thing. Is that clear? Right? So, my left hand, is it the same as my right hand? It is not the same as my right hand, but it is very similar, right? It's got the same number of fingers on it, thankfully. It's got this similar um, arrangement of the fingers, right? But my left hand is different from my right hand in the way that a mirror image is different from the real thing. If I hold up my right hand to the mirror, the image that I see is the image of my left Right? My left, my, my evil twin in the mirror is holding up his left hand as I hold up my right. Does that make sense? Oh wait, I'm the evil twin, right? Um, as, as the saying goes. Okay, so any time you have a, an organic molecule, a molecule made out of carbon, then you have something that can have four, cov four covalent bonds. If those four covalent bonds are connected to four different things, right? The red ball is a carboxyl group. The blue ball is an amino group. The gray ball is a hydrogen atom. And the green ball can be, turquoise ball rather, can be anything, yeah? It's the placeholder letter R, right? So these are isomers, aren't they? But they are different insofar as the left hand is different from the right, yeah? And the right hand and left hand, one is not superimposable on the other. I can't eclipse my left hand by holding up my right hand because the thumbs stick out the opposite sides of those hands. Does that make sense? Right? So they are asymmetrical because they have four different things on them each. And they are not superimposable, meaning that I can't take one and make the other disappear. Okay? Is that clear? Okay. So we actually use terms to describe these kinds of stereoisomers, chiral stereoisomers. We say D or L, and D is for dextrorotary, and L is for levorotary. In other words, we say dextro means right, levo means left. These are, um, these are right-handed and left-handed, respect, respectively. Does that make sense? All right. Why do we care? Well, as it turns out, all amino acids that your body is made out of, that a bacteria's body, or uh, all the proteins that your body uses, use left-handed amino acids. There are some in bacteria, some right-handed amino acids in peptidoglycan, but they're the exception, not the rule. The general rule is for any protein, a bacterial protein, a human protein, all of those proteins are made out of exclusively left-handed amino acids. Likewise, a lot of the sugars we eat are right-handed sugars. Go figure. Those, those facts are evidence of the commonality of all life, right? The idea that all life has a common origin. Furthermore, again, here we have a very tragic example of why chirality matters, okay? Um, <coughs> excuse me. So, um, have you heard of the, the, uh, uh, the drug thalidomide? Raise your hand if you've heard of this drug. Okay. Um, so you can see here, um, these are pictures of, of kids, mostly from Europe in the 50s, this drug, thalidomide, um, was very effective in treating morning sickness, but it caused a malformation of, of limbs in developing children in women who were pregnant and taking the drug. And the reason that was is because um, the molecule um, had two forms. The regular form, the right-handed form in this case, uh, was effective for treating morning sickness. The left-handed uh, formation of the drug um, was what caused birth defects. And if you left your jar of the drug in sunlight and little rays of sunshine hit the molecules, the molecules would break. And when they reformed, it was a coin toss whether they would reform back into right-handed molecules or whether they would flip into left-handed molecules. And so 
Um, and so as a result, um, you had some left-handed molecules in the concoction, and those were causing defects in the children. Um, nobody takes thalidomide anymore, except it's been found to be effective as a cancer drug. Um, <coughs> but uh, that's another story. Might be, yeah. So, um, and again, um, the legacy of this drug is, is tragic, but um, the, the, the right-handed molecule is apparently quite effective at doing its job. Um, but no, no doctor would be so reckless as to prescribe it. Okay, so um, you see from this example, tragic as it is, how important the shape of molecules is. All right? So as we learn, as we go through class, Molecules have shapes, and shapes matter. Their shapes do jobs. The molecules that your body is made out of have shapes, and those, the shapes of those molecules help those molecules do their jobs. Okay? All right. So, which is an amino group? How many people know the answer already? How many people... Every, everybody make a guess if you haven't made a guess, yeah? How many people got it right from today's lecture? Zero. One. Okay, two. One and a half. Hard to say. So if whether you did or not, um, could you get a question like this on a quiz? Sure you could, yeah. Um, all right, so um, biological polymers. Okay, I'm going to stop for a second. Everybody take a breather. Oh, we're going on to another topic. Okay, pause, stop.